Article 51. Yes. And your lordships will recall that if your lordships reject my earlier argument on the proper construction of Section 43, the alternative argument is that Section 43 must be construed consistently with A1 P1, which does not allow our submission uh, for the retroactive uh, application. Uh, my friend, Mr. Chamberlain, uh, does not dispute that A1 P1 requires a special justification for a retrospective interference with property rights, but he says uh, there was no retrospectivity in this case. And he emphasised to the court that many of the cases concerned interference with vested rights. Uh, he drew attention to Pressos, which was volume 4, tab 56, uh, Back, which was volume 4, 57, and the AXA case in the Supreme Court, volume 3, 43. But the judgments in those cases do not say that only an interference with vested rights and obligations suffices to impose the obligation to show a special justification for retrospectivity. The case that does deal with that question is Welsh asbestos. It does demonstrate in our submission that, that legislation analogous to section uh, 43 requires a special justification. That is where, as in Welsh asbestos and here, a new liability is being imposed to address a current problem, there the need to finance medical treatment, and the new liability is imposed by reference to acts done in the past. And if we could go back, please, to Welsh Asbestos, it's volume four of the authorities at tab number 51. Uh, I remind your lordships that the court uh, has seen at paragraph six of the judgment on page 1025 uh, what this bill did, and I won't repeat for all that, it imposed new obligations both on employers and uh, on uh, insurers. Uh, my friend, Mr. Chamberlain, emphasised that the, uh, the case proceeded by reference to a concession uh, as to retrospectivity. But can I remind your lordships that Lord Thomas, whose analysis was approved uh, for the majority by Lord Mance, uh, did not proceed by reference to uh, a concession. This is at page 1054, uh, just above letter D. Uh, His Lordship Lord Thomas has the heading, Is there retrospectivity in respect of the liability imposed uh, on employers? Uh, and His Lordship then sets out the circumstances, and in particular, because he's dealing here with liability on employers, he's not dealing with insurers, and at E, he says the liability imposed, though only in respect of future charges, is retrospective, as it is a new liability owed directly to Welsh ministers, which arises only by reason of negligence or breach of statutory duty, which had occurred prior to the coming into force of the bill. And then there's a bit more uh, detail. And at 104, his Lordship therefore agreed with Lord Max that imposing such direct liabilities retrospectively can be viewed as amounting to the deprivation of the possessions of the uh, employers. And I should have emphasised at the end of paragraph 103, thus the second effect of the bill has an element of retrospectivity, and for Lord Thomas, that's that is sufficient, uh, as he says at 104, imposing such direct liabilities retrospectively. Now, that does not proceed on the basis of any concession, it is a reasoned analysis, and it is that analysis because Lord Thomas was dissenting on the facts uh, with Baroness Hale, it is that analysis which commends itself to the majority. 
C. Lord Mance at paragraph 41, page 1036, letter G. In my opinion, in agreement on this point with Lord Thomas, and there's a specific reference. Sorry, which, which page? Uh, it's page 1036, <laughs> 1036. Paragraph 41. Yeah, got it. Thank this you. is Lord Mance for the majority, in my opinion, his lordship says, and in agreement on this point with Lord Thomas, paragraphs 103 to 104, and those are the specific paragraphs which address retrospectivity. A1P1 is engaged as regards both compensators and their liability insurers. Both are affected and potentially deprived of their possessions in that the bill alters their otherwise existing legal liabilities and imposes on them potentially increased financial burdens arising from events long past and policies made long ago. Again, not on the basis of a concession, although it is true, as Mr. Chamberlain points out, that concession there was in the circumstances of that case. But far from their lordships in any way doubting the validity or the, rather, the accuracy of, of the concession, their lordships in the majority and in the minority analyse uh, the question and, and find that there was here in, 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 the, in the asbestos case sufficient uh, retrospectivity uh, to require uh, that there be, there need to be a special justification. And that's why at paragraph 53, uh, Lord Mance says uh, that um, uh, the European court scrutinises with particular circumspection legislation which confiscates property without compensation or operates retrospectively. And uh, leaving the next sentence out, in the case of retrospective legislation, special justification will be required before the court will accept that a fair balance has been struck. So it's, it's not enough in such a case to say there must be a fair balance. You also need uh, special uh, justification. Uh, and in my respectful submission, that case is binding on this court uh, as to the need for a special justification in a case such as Welsh asbestos, and I say such as this case, where a new liability uh, it, 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 a new financial burden is being placed on persons by reference uh, to use the language of Lord Mance at paragraph 41, liability arising from events long past and policies made long uh, ago. And now we say that this tribunal, with respect, erred uh, in law uh, in its analysis of this A1P1 issue uh, as to the meaning of the legislation. I'm not here dealing with how they applied it to the facts. I'll come on to that. I need to persuade your lordships to grant us leave to amend. But in relation to what we have at all stages of, in relation to the meaning of the legislation, the tribunal addressed this issue at paragraph uh, 238, if you know that, please, to the tribunal decision for uh, one law, tab 8, uh, paragraph 238, which is on uh, page 212. 208. Uh, 238, paragraph 238. Uh, yes, thank you. And they're dealing here with A1, P1. Uh, and at 237, they referred to Welsh asbestos. At 238, we've already concluded, uh, and that's in relation to Lord Mustill's uh, analysis and the points I made on that, that Section 43 is not truly retroactive or retrospective legislation, but is legislation which can alter prospectively the rights and obligations arising from pre-existing relationships. Uh, uh, however, had it been necessary, 
consider the question of special justification, we would have accepted the regulator's submission that the extent to which the provisions operate retrospectively is fair and strikes a reasonable balance. Now, there are two errors in my submission there. First of all, there's the error that they fail to understand there's a need for a special justification. But your lordships may think uh, that that uh, is rather a technical objection if they did go on to ask themselves whether there was, in fact, a special justification. So that doesn't take me very far. I also have a complaint that they don't understand, with great respect to them, uh, in that sentence I, I just read out, that the question is not whether uh, the uh, legislation is fair and strikes a reasonable balance. The question uh, is whether or not there is a special justification. And the way that the tribunal put it minimises, in my submission, the need for a special justification uh, in a case of retroactivity. But are you saying that the, uh, the strike reasonable, fair and reason, whether fair and strikes a reasonable balance is not what is involved in considering whether, uh, on the European authorities, what is involved in considering whether there is a special justification? Well, it's part of it, but it's not all of it, for the reasons that are given by Lord Mance. If I could take your lordships back to the asbestos case, uh, volume 4, tab 51, uh, Lord Mance deals on page 1040 yeah. with the general test. This is paragraph 52. Uh, in paragraph 52, uh, his lordship refers to Strasbourg authority. He says the approach in Strasbourg to at least the fourth stage, that's the uh, uh, proportionality stage, involves asking simply whether weighing all relevant factors, the measure adopted achieves a fair or proportionate balance between the public interest being promoted and the other interests uh, involved. So that is the standard test. Uh, of proportionality under A1B1. And yeah. his lordship goes on to say at the fourth stage, all relevant interests ought to be weighed and balanced. That means not merely public, but also all relevant private interests. The court may be especially well placed itself to evaluate the latter interests, which may not always be fully or appropriately taken into account by the primary decision maker. And then he deals with special cases. It is also clear, 53, says Lord Mance, that the European Court scrutinises with particular circumspection legislation which confiscates property without compensation or operates retrospectively. And, and uh, in, in the, uh, leaving out the next thing, in the case of retrospective legislation, special justification will be required before the Court will accept that a fair balance has been struck. So you need something more than fair balance. It's true that the question is still, is there a fair balance? But there's an added requirement on uh, the respondent state or the public authority. And my criticism of, of paragraph 238 apart from the fact that the tribunal wrongly thought there was no need for a special justification uh, at all, it is that they, the tribunal, appear to think uh, that all one needs to show it is whether the retrospectivity is fair and strikes a reasonable balance. But that isn't the question. The question is whether, as Lord Mance puts it, there is a special justification for operating retrospectively. That's, that's the issue. Uh, and I say that's an error of law. Now, we then come to Mr. Chamberlain's uh, submission that your lordships should be very slow to interfere in, in this context because proportionality is a matter for the tribunal. And we have no right to appeal on the basis that um, this court would have assessed proportionality differently. 
And my friend uh, drew attention to the decision of this court in the Obrey uh, case, Lord Justice Sullivan, you may, may recall, yeah. uh, Volume 4, Tab 49A. I, 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 I don't quarrel with my friend Mr. Chamberlain's uh, uh, submission that it's not for this court to substitute its view on proportionality for that of the tribunal. But my friend, with respect, is right on that. But it, it may be helpful uh, to the courts just to be aware that the Supreme Court has analysed this issue and analysed it in, in slightly different terms to how the Obrey judgment looks at it. It's a very recent, well, it's 2018 judgment to the Supreme Court. Can I hand up? copies which my friends have, thank you very much, assistance of the usher. It's the case, uh, and this uh, I suggest is slotted in at um, volume 4, tab 54A. It's the Queen on the application of R against the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police and uh, another. And what this case concerned was whether it was a breach of the right to privacy in Article 8 of the European Convention for a criminal record certificate issued to a prospective employer of the claimant to include details of a criminal charge of rape of which the claimant had been acquitted. And he said, this is a breach of, of, of privacy to include in this record that I was charged with rape and I was acquitted. And on a judicial review, the High Court judge found that the interference with private life was proportionate, and one of the issues in the Supreme Court uh, was what approach should be taken in the appeal courts to a finding of proportionality in the context of Article 8. And, and, and the, the, there's one judgment in the Supreme Court, Lord Carnworth, speaking to the court, and it's at page 4098. Uh, paragraph 53, uh, at the bottom of page 4098, your Lordship see there's a heading proportionality in the appellate court. Uh, and uh, Lord Carmel says, before turning to the issues under Article 8 itself, it's necessary to address the dispute as to the correct role of the appellate court in such cases. There was no disagreement as to the correctness of the approach adopted by the judge of first instance, that is to make his own assessment of proportionality, but giving weight to the views of the primary uh, decision maker who has institutional competence, and then there's some authority. There is, however, an issue about the approach of the Court of Appeal, taking account of the guidance given by the Supreme Court uh, in re B. And over the page, there's a reference to the relevant rule which uh, provided the court will allow the appeal where the decision of the lower uh, court uh, is wrong. Now, I won't read page 4099, but what is apparent is that uh, there were different views in re B in the Supreme Court. And indeed, your Lordship see on page 4100 <coughs> that the Supreme Court was split in re B. Uh, paragraph 57, the minority view was that the appellate court, while taking account of the decision of the court below, must make its own assessment of proportionality. That was the view of Lord Kerr and of Baroness Hale. And to summarise, uh, it, um, uh, it, it was... Uh, essentially, uh, for uh, uh, the uh, uh, reasons uh, that were given uh, in, 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 uh, in argument, whatever it was Wednesday, um, uh, by my Lord, Lord Justice Mayles, my Lord suggested that perhaps it is, it's an issue of law and it would be most unfortunate to have different views by different High Court judges. And that was the reasoning of Baroness Hale and, and, and Lord Kerr, but it was a minority view. Uh, the majority took the view that wasn't the test, and the test is stated by Lord Carnworth at page 4102 at paragraph 64. In conclusion, <coughs> uh, the references cited above show clearly in his Lordship's view that to limit intervention to a significant error of principle is too narrow an approach 
at least if it's taken as implying that the appellate court has to point to a specific principle, whether of law, policy or practice, which has been infringed by the judgments of the court below. The decision may be wrong, not because of some specific error of principle in the narrow sense, but because of an identifiable flaw in the judge's reasoning. Such, a, such as a gap in logic, a lack of consistency, a failure to take account of some material factor which undermines the cogency of the conclusion. However, it's equally clear that for the decision to be wrong, it is not enough that the appellate court might have arrived at a different uh, evaluation. And there's a reference to a judgment of Lord Justice Elias. The appeal court does not second guess the first instance judge does not carry out the balancing task afresh as though it were rehearing the case it must follow, adopt a traditional function of review, asking whether the decision of the court below was wrong. So that's the current legal position. My submission, both in relation to assessments of proportionality, uh, but also in, 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 in other cases. Uh, is, that, is, that is that to be read then as um, effectively saying it is... Um, not enough that the appellate court would have arrived at a different conclusion. I mean, an, an appellate court might say, I haven't got much doubt about what I would have decided, but that's that's not enough. You've got to point to something of the nature of um, yeah. uh, what's identified in the previous sentence. Yeah. I mean, if the court is very clear that it would have arrived at a different conclusion, that may well be because the court has identified some flaw in the reasoning of the court or tribunal below, uh, some lack of cogency, some uh, gap in logic, lack of consistency, and matters of that sort. But I accept my friend Mr. Chamberlain's point. It's not enough for me to say to this court, your lordships surely would have arrived at a different conclusion. But what I don't have to do is to show an Edwards and Bearstow that uh, no reasonable tribunal could possibly have arrived at such a conclusion. I don't even need to show a, 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 an error of law. I have to show some identifiable flaw in the judge's or the tribunal's reasoning. Uh, and, 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 and that's a, a, a more liberal approach, uh, perhaps, than uh, had uh, traditionally been uh, adopted. But it's not enough for me to say, review this and, and rehear it. That's not my submission. I also point out that the Overy case to which my friend uh, referred was not mentioned in the judgment. Indeed, it's not even cited uh, in, the, uh, in the case of, 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 of the Manchester case. Um, so I, I respectfully suggest this is the guiding principle, not uh, uh, Overy. It is also true, of course, this was an appeal uh, from a court, not from a tribunal. Uh, but in my submission, that cannot make any difference that the case concerns an appeal from the uh, High Court. There's no basis for suggesting the test is different because we're here considering the reasoning of the upper tribunal. And in any event, I would, with genuine respect uh, for the tribunal in this case, doubt that even the members of that tribunal uh, would claim expertise uh, in applying convention law and the, uh, the principles of uh, proportionality under the European uh, Convention. So that's the test. Can I then invite the Lordships to return to uh, how the tribunal analysed proportionality at paragraphs 239 and 240, on which uh, my friend Mr Chamberlain uh, relied? I, I say uh, not merely they got the wrong test at, at 238. I respectfully submit their conclusions and their reasoning were wrong in the Lord Carnwood sense at 239 and 240. Their starting point at 239 is that the legislation was concerned with, quote, a social remedial aim. Uh, in my submission, that is the starting point uh, for analysis. It is not the end of the analysis. Uh, the Welsh asbestos bill uh, had a social remedial aim. Nevertheless, it was held to be in breach of A1P1 uh, because of its retrospective uh, application. It is not enough 
for my friends to say Section 43 has a social policy aim and regrettable financial consequences will follow unless the targets are required uh, to pay up. That's not my submission, that's not good enough. And uh, Lord Mance made it clear it's not good enough in the asbestos case, volume 4, tab 51, at uh, page 1045. <laughs> uh, 1045 uh, of asbestos, it's paragraph 66. The Lordships have that, volume 4, tab 51. Page 1045, paragraph 66. The Council General maintains that special justification exists for the retrospectivity involved in the Bill because without it, the Bill cannot achieve its legitimate policy aim. That is a circular submission which, if accepted, would eliminate the important balancing stage of the proportionality exercise uh, identified. We respectfully uh, adopt. Secondly, uh, there's a, an error at the end of paragraph 239 of where the tribunal say we agree with Mr. Stallworthy's submission that Parliament intended there to be a symmetry between the liabilities of the PPF and the FSD uh, regime. Uh, under A1P1, Lords, the question is not what Parliament intended. Indeed, we don't get to the A1P1 point unless Mr. Stallworthy is correct that Parliament did intend to allow the regulator to base an FSD on events or transactions which occurred prior uh, to 6th of April uh, 2005. Uh, the third error, which we say uh, one finds in these paragraphs, is that the Tribunal simply fails to focus at 239 and 240 on the reasons why there is no special justification for retroactive legislation here. And, and, and the reasons are, are those I've already identified. First, what the regulator is seeking to defend and what he must show there is a special justification for is a provision which applies even though all of the events and transactions which are said to justify the FSD occurred before the section came into force. That's what he has to show a special, or what he has to show a special justification for. Uh, but he also needs to show a special justification for this provision applying, even though there is no need for any fault, misconduct, or even criticism. The regulator also needs to show a special justification for the Section 43 retroactivity in a context, in a statutory context, where Parliament itself uh, has limited the retroactive effect of other provisions, Section 38 and Section 52, so they only have retroactive effect back to April 2004. Even though in those contexts, you do need fault or misconduct. And finally, the regulator needs to show a special justification, even though Parliament itself has decided, in the same legislation, that you need a clearance system under Section 46 to protect those who may be subject to uh, an FSD. And that clearance system cannot effectively apply if there's retrospectivity uh, back to dates in relation to events, transactions prior to the legislation coming into force. And, and we respectfully submit that the tribunal's decision is wrong in a Lord Carnworth sense because they simply don't grapple with those impediments to a special justification. Or alternatively, if I need to, I say no reasonable <coughs> tribunal uh, asking itself the right question, focusing on those issues, could come to the conclusion that there is here uh, a special justification. 
They have urge in principle. Uh, the other matter that they rely upon is the back, uh, back and Finland uh, decision, which was at volume 4, tab 57, uh, the uh, independent judicial assessment. I, I made my points in opening uh, on that case. The court is there concerned with two distinct forms of challenge uh, to legislation under A1P1. There's a substantive challenge, but there's also an obligation under A1P1 to have a fair procedure. And the fact that you have a fair procedure, in my submission, is no answer to uh, a, a criticism, a complaint as to the substance of the legislation. And, and the back case proceeded on the basis that there was simply no basis uh, for criticising the substance of the legislation in Finland in that context. That's why the court focused on uh, the uh, uh, procedure. Uh, my friend, Mr Chamberlain, then relied on the fact that Parliament has approved this legislation. My friend says, well, your lordships should um, uh, be very slow uh, to say this is uh, uh, disproportionate, uh, even though it's re even if he doesn't accept it is, even if it's retrospective, because Parliament's proved it. But again, the Welsh asbestos case deals with this. It's volume 4, tab 51. The relevant paragraph is paragraph 67 in Lord Manson's speech. Uh, on page 1046, paragraph 67, page 1046, uh, where Lord Matt says that Lord Thomas, for the minority, attaches great weight to the judgment of the Welsh Assembly. This is a measure which should, in the interests of Wales, be enacted. I agree, says Lord Matt, that weight should be given to the Welsh Assembly's judgment, but it is the court's function under the Act to evaluate the relevant considerations and to form its own judgment on the issue both of legislative competence and of consistency uh, with uh, convention uh, rights. And indeed, in, impo in important respects, we are relying on the judgment of Parliament because two of the factors that I've emphasised in criticising the tribunal's judgment, is that Parliament itself has decided that you need a Section 46 clearance procedure protect, to protect the interests of potential targets. And Parliament itself has decided that where there is to be uh, retrospectivity under Sections 38 and 52, it should only go back to April 2004, even in contexts where there's a need for fault or misconduct. And, and an important part of our case is that given that that's what Parliament has decided, it cannot be said that there is a special justification for greater retrospectivity in relation to Section 43 and FSDs. Can I, can I ask you um, just to confirm... I think I know from your your opening submissions what your position, but just, just so I'm absolutely clear. I mean, the Welsh bill case, the Welsh asbestos bill we've just been looking at, yes. looked at the legislation in the round. Um, I mean, obviously having regard to the, uh, the, the position of the insurers yes. or the compensators that would be a adversely affected by the operation of the of the statutory provisions. But it didn't it didn't it couldn't, given the nature of, of the the procedure, but it didn't consider the position of any particular affected person. Whereas of course no. we as as Mr. Chamberlain pointed out if Frequently in the Strasbourg court, the court's focus is on the facts of the particular case. But do, do you accept that the, although the facts of the particular case 
will illustrate the potential of the potentially unfair effect of the statutory provisions in particular circumstances. What the court is is doing is deciding whether the legislation as such does or does not satisfactorily safeguard rights generally under A1P1. I mean, you can't, in other words, have one outcome for one applicant and a different one for another. Well, this part of the case, uh, our submission is, is general. It's based on, on yeah. the content. Of I understand re, you know, when you get to three, then it's it's fact, it's yes, case it specific. But at this but part of the case, we are saying that this legislation, as constructed for all the reasons I've sought to advance, does not comply with A1P1. And that was the exercise carried out in the asbestos case. Yeah. And my friend, Mr. Chamberlain, although he objects to us then seeking to use A1P1 to challenge the uh, application by the tribunal of the legislation to the facts of this case, he does not object, and the regulator has never objected to us using A1P1 in order to challenge the compatibility of the legislation yeah. in principle uh, with uh, Article 1. He says we're wrong. He doesn't challenge the legitimacy of, of that exercise. Uh, uh, what he does challenge, and I'm coming on to it, is whether we can, at this stage, also use A1P1 to challenge the factual uh, applications. Just one other uh, point on uh, this part of the uh, uh, case, uh, my friend rely also relied on the fact that the court in the AXA case, the Supreme Court, by contrast, in the AXA case, rejected the challenge. Again, it was a challenge of principle. Can I just show your lordship why the challenge failed in the AXA case? It's volume three of your authorities. It's uh, tab 43. This is the plural black space. There's just one passage of your ships may wish to have in mind. It's in the judgment of Lord Hope uh, for the court. Uh, volume 3, tab 43. And the relevant passage is on uh, it's paragraphs 37 to 38, which appears on page 909. Page 909, Lord Hope, paragraph 37, says there are two special features of this case which seem to his lordship to show that the balance that was struck cannot be said to be disproportionate. The first is that the claims which the Act makes possible will only succeed if it's shown that the exposure to asbestos was caused by the employer's negligence. In other words, there was wrongdoing by the person who now has this new liability imposed. Page 909. Yeah, I've got it. Thank you. It's out of, uh, and the second feature is a paragraph 38. It's the business in which insurers are engaged, in pursuance of which they wrote the policy that will give rise to the obligation to indemnify, is a commercial venture which is inextricably associated with risk. They were long-term policies. There was inevitably a risk that circumstances unseen at the date might occur, which would increase the burden of liability. So that's a peculiarly insurance feature. That's why the claim failed in AXA. That does not assist uh, my friend Mr. Chamberlain. On the contrary, in a context such as this, where uh, we all agree uh, that there was no wrongdoing, uh, uh, no need for wrongdoing, put it properly, they're, they're under the Act, there's no need for the uh, uh, the regulator uh, to uh, show any fault or misconduct or indeed any criticism of uh, the, 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 the target. So for all those reasons, we say that the tribunal's analysis of the challenge to the legislation by reference to A1P1 involved a number of errors of law and principle. It was wrong in a Lord Carnworth sense. And we therefore invite the court to conclude that the legislation cannot satisfy A1P1. It must be interpreted consistently with it. 
to avoid retrospection, uh, and uh, the court we respectfully submit should use Section 3 uh, of the Human Rights Act to construe reasonable to preclude retrospective application, and by the court making a declaration under Section 6 of the HRA that the regulator cannot lawfully make an FSD uh, which is retrospective. My Lords, that leaves our application to amend so we can challenge the reasoning of the tribunal <coughs> on the application of A1P1 uh, in uh, this uh, uh, case. Uh, that has relevance, I envisage, only if your Lordships were to conclude that, that there would be force in our substantive A1P1 arguments, uh, but they fail because of the existence of a reasonable test, reasonableness test to be applied by the uh, tribunal. Then we seek to argue that the tribunal, in applying the criterion of reasonable, ought to have applied a special justification test. Uh, indeed, I say there's an air of unreality about the objection that my friend Mr. Chamberlain made because he was not in any way impeded or prejudiced in fully deploying his substantive arguments in defence of what the tribunal said. And there's a very substantial overlap between the points I've made already under A1P1 and the points that I would want to make uh, in relation to the challenge uh, to reasonableness. Well, I'm not sure it is quite that um, in terms of what the unfairness is. The, pr the problem as I see it, and uh, I'm only speaking for myself now, is that I, I think one of, one of Mr. Chamberlain's submissions is, well, when you, once you've decided the, the domestic construction issue, and, and for these purposes it has to be decided against you for A1P1 yes. to yeah, become relevant, you then move on to A1P1. And you, which is what you've done and what the tribunal did. Now, we've got your criticisms of the way they did it. Yes. Um, but, but, but let's assume against you for the purpose of this, this argument that, in fact, their, their uh, assessment of special justification passes muster. Now, if that's right, then I think what Mr Chamberlain says is, well, that's the end of that issue. You don't, you don't then revisit it uh, as part of the reasonableness. I mean, if, if the fact that the Act stipulates a test of reasonableness is relevant to the assessment of whether there's special justification, you make that assessment at this second stage uh, once you, you, you're satisfied that, that it, it works then all that the tribunal does when it gets to make the reasonable assessment is decide whether it's reasonable. Yes, it yes. Doesn't, doesn't have to satisfy some, some extra hurdle as part of that assessment. Now, I think, I think the point that was, that was in play was that, well, are there circumstances in which the special justification test, so to speak, is transposed into the reasonableness assessment? And one possibility, but I'm not saying it's the only possibility, would be if you say, well, in order to satisfy A1P1, uh, you have to up the hurdle, raise the hurdle at the reasonable stage, in effect, to, to require the, 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 that assessment to include one of special justification. Which That's is, our submission. That is yeah. our submission. We say... But then... But then that's a temporal. But then you've got to, I think, then accept that you. I mean, you. All you're really doing is just passing the. Passing the issue down the line. Yes, and I'm seeking to do that in case my earlier submissions on how um, um, A1 P1 prevents use of retrospectivity in the legislation itself uh, does not succeed. I then say, well, this tribunal has to apply a reasonableness test, and the reasonableness test must be informed 
by the obligations that exist under the under the convention. And they're the same arguments, but they're simply applied to the part of the tribunal's reasoning where it looks at the application of the statutory test in section 43.7 to the facts of this particular case. But isn't, isn't, isn't the problem that nobody told the tribunal that at the reasonableness stage that was the hurdle that needed to be cleared? Well, I, I accept that was not our argument at the tribunal stage. Uh, uh, but, in my submission, the same factors that we are seeking to rely upon now uh, are, um, uh, are, are, are the factors that the tribunal should have looked at under the test of reasonableness. Can I just show you, Lord, just how we want to put it? Because my, my Lord of Justice Patton understandably said, let's see what, what, what it looks like. And we've given uh, our friends uh, the draft. I hand in what, what we've drafted. And we've got two points. The, the, the first is the tribunal failed to recognise that the relevant section was read with Article 1 of the protocol, meaning that an FSD cannot be reasonable if it's applied with retrospective effect unless there is a special justification. And the tribunal, we say, erred in the final sentence of paragraph 581 by stating the test as being whether the degree of unfairness or hardship is so significant that we should conclude that it would not be reasonable to direct the issue of an FSD to the targets. And we say that's a reversal of the applicable principle uh, uh, under A1P1. But it's equally in our submission, and Mr Green will deal with this, not a, a, a proper statement of, of, of the test under domestic law. Uh, and secondly, in any event, the tribunal erred in failing to understand in paragraphs 586 and 588 that there was and could be no special justification in the present case. And those are the same factors that I've focused on in my challenge to the legislation. Each of the factors relied on by the tribunal was based on retrospectivity. Now, there was no fault or misconduct or even grounds for criticism. There was no basis, we say, for finding a special justification in the context of an act which includes the clearance procedure and provides for limited retrospective effect. And the tribunal at 5864 wrongly relegated retrospectivity to a factor on which some weight uh, should be placed. Now, it doesn't matter for our purposes whether one addresses these criticisms by reference to the need for a special justification under uh, uh, A1P1, or whether one addresses these criticisms uh, under uh, a, 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 a test of giving some teeth to a reasonableness test uh, in the context of legislation, which we all agree imposes a very uh, uh, substantial financial disadvantages on the targets. I would submit, Mr. Green would submit, one's got to apply some rigour to this test in any event. And the tribunal's analysis in our submission uh, was uh, wholly uh, inadequate. I mean, I, I mean as, as to that, as you put it just there, well, that's within the scope of your existing yes, grounds of appeal, as I understand it. You don't need a new one. No. Um, but if you want to rely specifically on a special justification point, what is problematic is, aside from the merits otherwise, um, the tribunal not having had that particular point uh, drawn to its attention, yes. it understandably hasn't dealt with it in terms. Mr Chamberlain no. says, well, we can see what th no. they thought, but suppose that's not right. Yes. Um, so they haven't addressed in terms the special justification point. Um, so suppose you, 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 you succeeded to some degree on this. What happens? The case goes back. Can I, can I tell you, Lordship, how I would put it? I, I recognise the force of the point that your Lordship is putting to me, and Lord Justice Mayos put to me, that this was not advanced before the tribunal. I 
and therefore your lordships may think that our criticism of paragraph 581, that they stated the test wrongly, uh, is an unfair criticism. I, I understand the force of that. But the second part of my submission, that is paragraph two of this, this, this round, is essentially a submission that applying the right test, uh, special justification, there was only <coughs> one answer to which the tribunal could properly come. That is, on all these agreed circumstances, looking at everything that uh, your lordships know about this case, it cannot be said that there is a special justification on the facts of this case. And if that is right, if your lordships can be persuaded that's right, it really is a very technical objection from my friend that the point wasn't put to the tribunal in that way. Because nothing the tribunal could have said would alter that conclusion. That's how I would put it. So just to understand, if one were to confine your further ground of appeal to that very particular yes. way of putting yes. it, you say there would be no need to send the, the case back. Absolutely not. I, I would either succeed. I'm not asking your lordships to say that they didn't consider matters and so it should go back to them. I'm putting my case on, on this part of, of the matter at a high level. I'm saying that a special justification is required. The tribunal, had they asked the right question under A1, P1, on the facts of this case, could only have come to the conclusion that there is no special justification for the retrospective uh, application to my clients on the facts of this case. Now, if I'm wrong on that, well, then that's the end of that point. If I'm right on it, then it really cannot avail, uh, Mr Chamberlain, to say the tribunal didn't have an opportunity to, to deal with this. He's dealt with it, he's made his submission, and your lordships either think it's a good point or a bad point. The fact that it wasn't raised before the tribunal, who of course did have the convention uh, issues raised uh, in front of them in relation to the legislation, is really nothing to the point. But I mean, this, this, that, that, that argument is the one we've just heard. In relation you. to the legislation, yes. Yes, but I mean, if, if you're right, and they didn't, they didn't adequately grapple with the, the special justification um, criterion, when they when they did in, in yes. terms consider um, a one p one in yes. in paragraphs two, three, eight, nine, and thereabouts, well, then it seems to me logically. Uh, the uh, the act uh, your your case on that succeeds subject to how you decide the act needs to be read yes, down yes, in order yes, to, yes. to cater for it. Now um, I, I don't I I, I, I'm, I still don't understand why when one gets I mean, I mean if you're right you're right at that stage. Yes. I don't I don't see how you can not be right at that stage. And it sort of comes back to bite you later on. Well, can I tell you, Lordships, how I, I would put it? It is possible that your Lordships may say that part of my submission challenging the legislation under A1P1 is, is, is correct. But, but the legislative scheme allows for an independent judicial assessment by reference to Well, I can see that. I can see. And, and therefore... It all depends on, on how the, the tribunal approach a particular case. And then I, I say, yes, and they didn't approach it in the right way in no. relation to A1P1 factors, accepting as I do that I can't now make technical objections they didn't put it in the right way. But I am entitled to say, my submission, that there was only one answer on the A1P1 argument they could have. I mean, putting it very broadly, without reference to technicalities, you're sort of picking up uh, uh, something raised by Lord Justice Bales earlier, that, that there seems to be an oddity in saying, well, you pass A1P1 at the first stage um, uh, because there's a test of reasonableness, but then retrospectivity is irrelevant when you come to reasonableness. Well, I, I don't say that. that that's not technical. 
because it's the point with, with respect that my lord raised may have been on, on Monday or Tuesday, where your, your lordship put, I think, to me that it might be said that crucial to this statutory scheme, we don't accept this, but it might, might be thought crucial to the statutory scheme is the statutory test of, of reasonableness. And our submission then is, well, yes, if that's the case, one's got to give real force and significance to how the tribunal apply the reasonableness test. And here, for the various reasons I've identified, and Mr. Green has identified, he's going to reply uh, in, in, in a few moments uh, after Mr. Relton, uh, they didn't do it. That, that's how I put it. And I therefore respectfully invite uh, your Lordship's uh, leave to uh, amend. I, I entirely understand the objection uh, to uh, the first way we put it, which is a technical uh, uh, point. That's the, uh, the, the, uh, the paragraph one of the uh, uh, amendment. Uh, and the paragraph two is on the basis there was and could be no special justification in the present case. That's how we put it. So the fact they didn't have the point before them is simply irrelevant. There's no suggestion we're relying on some new fact or matter. All of the facts and matters are those they had before them and we have legitimately uh, uh, relied upon in relation to the challenge to the legislation. Uh, well, that, that, that's how I, 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 I put the matter. Thank you. Very good. Yes, it's right. <coughs> My Lord, uh, round two. Um, as my Lords are aware, we have separate points in relation to the TRIO and the TUK. And following uh, your Lordship's indication in respect to notice, the points that remain are in respect of the TRIO, the clause 4.2 construction point, and in respect of TUK, whether the appointment of the receivers severed the association that's necessary. Yep. <clears throat> and my Lord, Mr. Arnold <clears throat> is quite right to say that for the technical purposes of jurisdiction, the regulator succeeds if it establishes connection through either the TRIO or TUK. And we, of course, say it succeeds on neither. But we would flag, um, to my Lord's, that if we were to lose on one, and the court were otherwise satisfied that there was jurisdiction, uh, it would not be irrelevant to know the position on the other. And that is simply because, should this matter proceed to an FSD, it may be a relevant factor at that stage, whether the association established, um, which we would say will on any basis be of a technical nature, extends to just one side of the structure on the structure chart, in other words, to the Thorn side or to the Granada side, or extends to both. And it might therefore be of assistance, should this matter continue, for that question to be resolved. But my words, as I said, um, on our case this doesn't arise, as the regulator cannot um, establish association through either side of the structure. And in relation to the substance of the points uh, raised by Mr. Arnold, I would start by May with a position relating to the TRIO, where at the relevant time, of course, the security agent was the registered holder of the shares. Yeah. As my lords have rightly identified, the key issue here is what meaning should be given to the words whilst no declared default exists in clause 4.2 venture. And Mr. Arnold's primary response to this was to say that the words make it absolutely clear what period of time the clause is intended to operate during. But my lords, that in our submission is a wholly inadequate answer to the point, because it accepts that the rights granted to the chargeur under the clause in respect of shares registered in the name of the security agent, otherwise end on a declared default, and therefore need to be revived or continued by clause 10.2. Meaning on the regulator's, the regulator's case, unlike on our construction, that the words serve no purpose at all, and the clause would work in the same way without them. Now, my Lord, in 
uh, a further attempt, it seems, to get round this problem, Mr. Arnold advanced a new argument in relation to Clause 10.2 uh, and the wording of the proviso. And my lords, it may be useful just to turn up that wording. It's in Supplemental Fund 3, uh, Tab 36, at page 689. rights in respect of the shares registered in the security agent's name. And the point taken arose uh, in the context of Mr. Arnold trying to neutralise our argument based on the language of continue to exercise voting rights, which as my Lord will see appears in the proviso at the bottom of page 689. And we said that that language shows that the clause was looking only to rights which did not end on a declared default under clause 4.23. And Mr Arnold's argument was that even if the language of continue had the implication we say it did, the surrounding language, he said, of may exercise any and all voting rights was wide enough to confer the power to exercise voting rights on the charge order. This was not a point um, raised before the tribunal, or indeed as we read it in the regulator's scale. That, no that is right, is it? Because when he said it, I wasn't surprised that he was saying it. I, I, I thought I had encountered it before. Well, we're, all, we're not consciously aware of having encountered <laughs> it before, but yep. we make no objection. I mean, in, in, in a sense, it's um, a point of construction. Any point. It's not a matter of construction at this stage. Um, but that doesn't make it any better. Uh, and in fact, in our submission, it's, it's fundamentally false. And there are, there are three points that we'd make in respect of it. Um, first, if one just looks at that wording of the proviso that I know my lords um, have in front of you, it does require some grammatical contortion to treat the may as governing exercise only and the shall as governing the continued to exercise. Uh, any normal reading of the clause, um, we would suggest, would take both may and shall together. In other words, it's may and shall continue to exercise. It's the language of permission and obligation in relation to the continuation of rights. It's not the language of the grant of rights. So that's the first point. But the second point is that Mr Arnold's argument um, posits a situation where the rights granted to the chargeor under clause 4.23 have terminated on a declared default. And we would suggest that it is an improbable drafting technique that those rights which have on this premise ended on a declared default are immediately granted afresh under clause 10.2. My words, third if the power to exercise any voting rights is granted by these words in this clause 10.2 proviso, it is very difficult to see how it could be a power to exercise the voting rights in respect of the shares which are registered in the security agent's name. And that's for the simple reason that there is no mechanism at all provided in the proviso to enable that to happen. And my lords, I'm sure, will recall that in clause 4.23, which is on page 675 of the fund, the clause gave a right to the chargeor to direct how the shares could be voted. Sorry, clause 4? It's 4.23, yeah. my lord. Uh, at the bottom of page 675. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My lords will, will remember, it's, it's really the last, or beginning in the um, third line um, of that subparagraph of the proviso. Yes. 
there is a provision that permits the charge or to direct in writing how the shares uh, can effectively be voted, and then a provision that requires um, the security agent to provide a prot to enable that to happen. But when one looks at Mr. Arnold's argument in respect of clause 10.2, um, there is nothing there in relation to that mechanism which enables something like that to happen. And on Mr. Arnold's approach, it would appear that something like that would have to be implied, which in our submission would be a further indication that this new point is simply wrong. But in other words, what we say the exercise does do, though, is that it confirms the construction that we put on the proviso. Well, sorry, sorry, sorry does it? If, I mean, if continue means continue, don't you simply continue on the same basis as before, which is with the benefit of the mechanism which applies before there is a declared default? My word, that was, in, in one respect, the, the prior one, <laughs> in that we had a debate as to whether or how this applies in circumstances where on a declared default the rights have come to an end under clause 4.2. Mr. Arnold's argument is to say, well, okay, if the targets are right in respect of that in clause 4.23, and the rights did end on a declared default, never mind, you can come to the proviso to clause 10.2, and that proviso, by saying may exercise, and reading separately and shall continue, so saying may exercise, he says, is the positive granting of a new power to do so. And so, my Lord, I entirely take well, your Well, I mean, point. I've, I've probably had one or two arguments behind, at least, but um, why, why isn't the effect of clause 10.2 that the termination, I mean, if, if Mr. Arnold is generally right on, on what he says about it, that the termination of voting rights, which would otherwise have happened, doesn't happen? Well, my Lord, that is um, the, um, what we have called, if you like, the prior argument. And we say that doesn't, that doesn't work simply because if you're giving any effect at all to the words in clause 4.23 of whilst no declared default exists, those rights must end on a declared default. And we say that when you have the language of continuation to exercise, you're looking at rights that are extant at that time. Well, it's a very sort of it's a highly sort of literal approach, isn't it? Well, my Lord, it's... I mean, uh, and also, sorry, just before you answer the question, I mean, I mean, isn't to some extent all that dependent on what, what effect you give to the opening words of 4.23, namely subject to clause 10.2, because it might be said that what the draftsman is trying to do there was make it clear that the regime which, as you've explained, would otherwise operate on the, on the declared default is, so to speak, suspended, I mean, that's my word, uh, in, the, in the terms of the proviso in 10.2. My Lord, in, 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 indeed, we don't suggest that's not a possible construction, yes. it's a construction that the tribunal Favor. Well, exactly. But, but in doing so, uh, it was wrong because, uh, as I've already submitted, it uh, effectively airbrushed those words whilst no declared default exists. Again, as I've already submitted, in a document of this sort, where you have a structured proviso with three subparagraphs all turning on whilst no declared default exists, if there is a construction that makes sense of it, gives effect to the words, uh, that, in our submission, should be preferred to one that doesn't. But well, that was all I was going to say in relation to Mr. Arnold's uh, new point. Yeah. Uh, just briefly, if I may, in relation to the commercial factors relied upon by the tribunal uh, in paragraphs 156 and 157 of the judgment, <coughs> uh, it was a noticeable feature of Mr. Arnold's submissions that he at no stage sought to advance any reason for the distinction 
between the two roots, uh, which as I sought to demonstrate to you when, when opening this graph, demonstrate to you when opening this graph, uh, are clearly recognised in the venture for taking security over shares. In other words, the route where legal title stays with the charge or, or the route where it's transferred to the security agent. And equally, Mr. Arnold didn't seek to advance any practical reason as to why the security agent might choose one over the other. But my lords, what we would suggest is that it can be inferred from the fact of the choice that there were practical differences between them. And the obvious one, reflected, we say, in the wording of the adventure, is a different position in respect of voting rights. And my Lord, as to the commercial point that was rightly rejected by the tribunal in a paragraph 158 of their judgment, this was the suggested concern by security agents to avoid the risk uh, of being deemed to be shadow directors. Uh, Mr. Arnold took it briefly. He relied essentially by reference to the points and material referred to in his written submissions of paragraph 100. And my Lord, in case this should be of any interest to you, I would make three very short points in respect to this. The first is that the material relied upon uh, when examined, and Mr. Arnold understandably uh, didn't expose it to scrutiny, but when examined, it doesn't begin to establish any real commercial concern in this respect, and certainly not one that could be inferred to be relevant to security agents generally, uh, still less to the security agent in this case. Secondly, it is not at all obvious how merely assuming legal voting rights as shall could without more ever expose a security agent to the risk of being a shadow director. And my lords, thirdly and briefly, if a security agent was really concerned about this and wanted to avoid that risk, why on earth did he opt under the venture to be the registered shareholder? In other words, in our submission, the argument really goes nowhere. <coughs> I mean, I understand the arguments you've just put forward. In terms of what the tribunal actually said, in the second sentence of paragraph 158, they say, in the absence of any evidence as to the practice of J.P. Morgan, and whether it... Uh, had that concern. Is that relevant? Well, my lord, uh, one suggestion was that um, <coughs> what, I mean, how it applied here was that there was an actual concern that um, was relevant to the drafting of this adventure. Now, the way in which one, I think, that it was attempted to establish the concern was to show by reference to what we say is the inadequate material in the cases, um, that there was a market or generic concern that could then be applied. I mean, if, if as a matter of fact, there were no concern at all with these security agents, uh, then it would be very difficult to see um, how it could be a relevant factor. I'm, I, I suspect this is entirely a red herring, but I, I, I'm just trying to work out how the objective principle bites on this. Does the subjective concern of J.P. Morgan not to expose itself to the risk come into it? Well, the, the, the two merge here because one would look objectively and through that one would uh, effectively make inferences as to and, what security agents... And the three points you put forward, I think, all uh, are consistent with an objective approach. Yes. Um, the, objective, the objective approach is certainly the starting point, but the tribunal, we make no criticism of the tribunal, they um, reflected that um, through the particular security agent. Well, if I could move on to, to TUK, which raises the, the different position of the charge or as registered holder. And the issue um, here um, now is the consequences of the appointment of the receivers. And as to this, Mr. Arnold sought to neutralise our reliance on Unidair by first distinguishing it, and secondly, by inviting you to hold, um, if necessary, that it was wrongly decided. Now, my lords, we accept that part of Mr. Justice Lewison's reasoning 
was that Holdings was a bad trustee of the shares in Kilnor for Coso. And Mr Arnold is quite correct to say that we have never sought to identify THSP as being a bad trustee, either before or after the appointment of the receivers. But in our submission, that is simply not an answer to our reliance on Unidem. And in order to respond to Mr Arnold's submissions on this, there are a number of points to consider. But I would start, if I may, by addressing first the underlying rationale and reasoning of Unidem, and then secondly, the suggested distinction um, between the controlling interest test in the tax cases and the control test in section 435. And as to the underlying rationale in unit day, the case is shown in our submission that the key question is whether the registered shareholder has discretion in the way the shares are voted uh, in its name. That was the point made by Lord Green in, in Biddy, contrasting, you'll recall, a bare trustee to a trustee with uh, who he described as having the usual discretion. It was acknowledged as the area of debate in the House of Lords in Biddy by Lord Russell, who referred again, you'll recall, to the position of the nominee. Uh, and it was the basis on which Lord Evershed in Silver drew the distinction between the bare trustee and the, the custodian trustee. And of course, in Unidair itself, the key finding of the court there was that discretion had moved entirely to COSO. And one sees that, you'll recall, in paragraphs 10 and 21 of the decision. Now, the debate in those cases, of course, originated in the context of a bare trustee. And indeed, Mr. Justice Lewison's finding that there was a bare trust in unit can be used to put the narrow ratio of that case into that category. But my Lord, that prompts the question as to what is it in relation to a bare trustee which makes the difference and which means he isn't entitled to exercise the voting power. And my Lord, the position with a bare trustee is, of course, that there's a split between legal and beneficial ownership. And in relation to a bare trust, the traditional analysis is that the trustee is obliged to do what is told by the beneficiaries and is at risk of losing the legal title at any stage should the beneficiaries so request it. Does a bare trustee have to do what is told by the beneficiaries? Well, my lord, that's precisely what I was, I was going to come on to. That is the traditional view, but it is doubted in some of the authorities, it's doubted in some of the Commonwealth um, jurisdictions. Um, and as a result, frequently, there is a specific <coughs> provision that addresses the matter. As I mean, a bare trust is still a trustee. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. So he has the, the usual fiduciary obligations to the uh, beneficiary that any trustee would have. I mean, all the bare means is that, uh, that uh, there's, no, there's no residue of, I suppose, discretion or anything of that kind in terms of, of who's entitled to the trust property. Indeed. Um, I mean, you can collapse the trust. You can do a Saunders and Vautier. But I don't see that in the meantime the beneficiaries can necessarily tell the trustee what to do. As the, the rationale um, in relation to when Lord Green was considering it at was I think it's probably fair to say at the time when it was generally regarded that the trust that the beneficiaries could do that with a bare trust. Uh, these days there is more doubt um, about that, which is why it is very often covered by a contractual or a specific provision in whatever the trustee is or the arrangements between the trustee and the beneficiary. And you'll remember in looking at, at Unida, and it may just be worth um, turning up that case, if I could invite my lords to go to authorities bundle two, tap the first
sorry, I'm only interrupting you. I'm just thinking about when to pause. So, I, I mean, are you get, how much longer are you going to be on 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 ground two? Uh, my Lord, probably about uh, 20, 25 minutes, all depending. Um, oh, right. Well, <laughs> well, then I, I think we will stop now. I, I mean, if you were only going to be another five minutes or so, uh, then, um, then I'd wait till you finish. But I think in the circumstances, we'll, we'll, we'll take a break. Thank you. 
that's no offense. <laughs> Still in your kitchen as well. Time to pop up. Uh, yes, which, sorry, remind me which tab we're, we're going to... Lord, it's authority fund 2, yeah. um, tab 34, the unit there position. Yeah. I was inviting my lords to go to paragraph 10. Uh, on page 493. Uh, simply that to remind you that um, how it was dealt with in the unit uh, case was by a power of return, and one sees between letters G and H what was provided for in that power of return. And clauses 1 to 5, it seems quite clear, is setting out the contraction position between holdings and cozo including one sees <coughs> directly halfway between G and H, um, it, that is COSO, was entitled to exercise its powers as attorney in its absolute discretion. And then clause six um, added uh, a trust position. But the substance of the obligation was in the contractual clause. And it was a contract which clearly removed the discretion and that, coupled with the matters that, or the extracts I referred uh, you to before in respect of Bibi and Silkwood, uh, shows in our submission that the rationale underlying all this is the absence of discretion. In other words, we suggest there's no magic in the registered shareholder being a trustee or a bear trustee for legal title. The relevant question is what role or entitlement he has as registered shareholder the fact that he himself may have some beneficial interest or an equity of redemption to give effect to is simply irrelevant if, as legal owner, he has no entitlement to exercise voting power. And a beneficial interest, of course, might give an entitlement to control the exercise of the voting power. But rightly, there's no suggestion here that that was so. And perhaps if I could just put it briefly another way around, um, if the power of attorney in Unidaire had not had its clause 6 that one sees in paragraph 10, in other words, no provision for creating a trust, would it make any difference? In our submission, clearly not. Or if COSO was a joint venture with Holdings, in which Holdings had a small, say, 20% interest, again, in our submission, it would make no difference. And the reason why it would make no difference is because the focus here is on the entitlement of the legal owner to exercise voting power. And whether that legal owner has that entitlement depends on whether he retains discretion to exercise the voting right. And that, of course, necessarily depends on the totality of the arrangements he's made with others, whether contractual, equitable, or both. So, my lords, in our submission, the reasoning underlying unida is that of discretion and the absence of it, however it arises. Uh, and indeed, my lords may recall that the first authority I referred the court to on Tuesday, that of Siemens and Burns, for reference only authorities 1, tab 13, was a case where the master of the roles, Sir Charles Smith, uh, expressly envisage a contract with a third party having the effect of excluding or controlling the exercise of the voting rights of 
the register shackled them. But we're all, it's then suggested by Mr. Arnold that the tax cases from which Mr. Justice Lewison derived his views in Unidare are themselves of limited value in the section 435 context because they concern different language, that as we've seen of controlling interest. Yeah. And we're looking for actual control in the 51 percent sense. <coughs> Um, whereas section 43510B is, it was suggested, materially different because it proceeds on the basis of deemed control. Now, in other words, to some extent, of course, that is right, but it's not in our submission a material distinction for present purposes. And the main reason for that is that both section 435 and the tax statutes are searching for control. Section 435, subsection 7, makes that clear in respect of the insolvency. And section 435, subsection 10, teases out what's meant by control in that context. And if my lords still have Unidur open, it may be that the best place to see the section is in paragraph 31 um, of that report, page 497. Uh, my lords, I know, are very familiar with the wording of it. But the only deeming feature that one has in it is that one third of the voting power is sufficient. In other words, a, unlike 51%, it may not amount in fact to control. But there is nothing in the wording which says anything about when a shareholder is entitled to exercise uh, or to control the exercise of that voting power. In particular, there is nothing at all in the subsection which deems a registered shareholder to be entitled to exercise the voting power if he's the legal owner of a third of the shares. So, my lords, in, in our submission, it is wrong to say that the deeming element in section 435 is a material difference when looking for control in the present context. The substantive inquiry in the tax cases, we would suggest, would have been the same, even if the 51% had been recalibrated to the one third. Well, let, let just just can we just part the tax cases for a minute um, and the tax legislation, uh, which is I think you accept, accept although the word control is, is is part of it, and just look at section. Four through five ten. When an, when a receiver is appointed, um, which bit of ten does it impact on? Well, from the from the start, the start position is that the the holding company, let's say, is the registered holder of the shares in the in the relevant subsidiary. Yes. So. Prima facie, as the registered holder of those shares, it can vote those shares. Yes. And indeed, it's the only person that can vote those shares. Uh, yes, subject to any contractual rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been seen. But that's the starting point, right? So, so where where um, uh, where it remains the registered holder of the shares, but uh, a receiver comes in, then. Where, where, where does that impact, and in what way does that impact, in in terms of ten? Well, my lord, in so far as prior to the receivership, the uh, charge or was entitled both to exercise and control the exercise. The appointment of the receiver removes both, and I don't think that there is any uh, the way in which the dispute is formulated. I don't think there's any dispute in relation to control the exercise. The question here relates to the fact that the charge or still has legal title. And can exercise. Yeah, and, and, well, and the so, question is whether that gives by itself an entitlement to uh, exercise one third or more yeah. of the voting power, even if, uh, as is the situation following the appointment of the receiver, there's no discretion, no influence, no involvement of any sort. When you say he, you mean the directors don't? 
Well, it, I'll come to the agency <laughs> point uh, in a moment, which of course was the, the main element of, of the answer. But if you're looking at the directors or the shareholders for these purposes as being identified as the, the charge or rather than the receivers, then the answer is absolutely obvious. The question, though, is whether you could then identify the receivers as effectively being uh, one or other of those, and therefore the charge all. But but to, to, to be fair, of course, you don't have to choose. They could both be within this. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, and the focus of, of this debate is whether the charge or is, uh, the receivers are. Uh, there's no doubt about that. They are caught by Section 4 and 5 but before coming to the particular criticisms uh, made by Mr. Arnold of the application of Unidair in our case, could I just deal briefly with his bigger criticism that the Unidair uh, line blurs the distinction between those two entitlements in uh, 10b. Uh, our submission, that's not so at all. There will, of course, be many cases where the same person has the entitlement to both, to exercise and control the exercise. But it's always important to look at each individual strand, and in particular to make sure that the person who's entitled to control the exercise is included within the scope of the section, as such person will clearly have control. And there will clearly, in our submission, be many cases where the person entitled to control the exercise of voting power will not be entitled to exercise voting power, and the position of for example, a parent company of the shareholder may be a common example of that. A shareholder, as legal owner, would be entitled to exercise the voting power that is susceptible to directions from its shareholder, the parent, um, who is entitled to control the exercise of voting power. And depending on the arrangements between, it, between them, they may both be entitled to control. But equally, there would be in our submission <coughs> where the entitlement to control the exercise of voting power has been ceded by the registered shareholder to another, but that person retains the entitlement to exercise voting power. And an example may be um, if the registered shareholder retains um, possibly a limited veto on certain prescribed matters, um, such as territorial expansion in a particular country, it would be very doubtful as you could be said to control the exercise of voting power at any general meeting. But on the Unidair bidding discretion test, he would be entitled to exercise voting power um, because he will have an element of discretion. Now, whether and when there is a difference between the two limbs will necessarily depend on the particular facts of particular cases. In other words, where there is discretion, short of controlling the exercise at any general meeting. But the relevant question here is whether the situation where there is no discretion and no practical control brings THSP within the ambit of section 43510B. And before, before leaving this um, topic, I should mention that on the regulator's case, as we understand it in relation to the TRIO, the security agent um, will be entitled to exercise the voting power once it becomes the registered shareholder, once it takes legal title to the shares. Uh, and indeed, on the regular basis, regulator's case, would continue in that position even while all discretion has been ceded to the charge or prior to a declared default under clause 4.23. And that, we would suggest, is simply not a realistic interpretation. It's not what Section 435 is targeting. And it is, we would suggest, a surprising result that taking security in that way makes the security agent an associate of the charge or subsidiaries. But my lords, if I could move on, um, particularly in view of the time, to Mr. Arnold's particular criticism or distinctions in relation to the application of Unidair to our case, there are two particular ones I would address. The first is Mr. Arnold's attempt to support the tribunal's comment in paragraph 190 of the judgment that by analogy with <coughs> Unidair, uh, THSP was in the position of COSA. And the reason for that, it was said by Mr. Arnold, 
was because THSP retained a beneficial interest in the shares charged. Now, Marines, that is, that is true. But the beneficial interest for these purposes, as I hope I've already demonstrated, is an irrelevant comparison. Because there is no suggestion that the beneficial interest gave THSP any form of control after receivers were appointed. The relevant question is whether legal ownership as the registered shareholder gave an entitlement to exercise voting power. And in circumstances where the receivers um, had the benefit of irrevocable promises and THSP had no discretion uh, at all in the exercising of voting rights. And then the second point to address here, which also picks up the point I brought, just as you referred to um, earlier, is Mr. Arnold's suggested distinction that the receivers owed fiduciary duties to the chargeor and therefore were potentially accountable to the chargeor, at, at least in circumstances outside the standard exclusion of liability, which we see in Clause 16 of the debenture. But again, we would suggest that it is hard to see how that is a valid distinction. Agents generally um, owe fiduciary duties, as do those who hold powers of attorney and proxies, which are, of course, a form of agency. And the content of the duty is, however, shaped by the contractual terms and context relating to it. And in relation to COSO, for example, the duty would be, in principle, quite limited given the complete discretion ceded to it. But it still wouldn't be able to um, set out to damage holdings or use its name for illegal or criminal purposes. In those circumstances, holdings might have remedies against COSA for the way the power had been exercised. But the existence of duties owed by an agent cannot answer uh, the question uh, whether the registered shadow is entitled to exercise the voting power. It is a different point. And at all, finally, when considering the, the Unidare decision and the criticisms made of it by Mr. Arnold, we would suggest that it is necessary to, to stand back. And like Mr. Justice Lewis, um, apply an element of common sense as to what is actually being looked for. The search is for someone who has an actual entitlement to exercise voting power. It's not targeting those um, who don't. And there is no policy reason at all that it should. In my words, I've already taken my lords through and opening the individual elements of the reasoning of Mr. Justice Lewison in paragraph 58. I think in view of the time, it's probably unnecessary to repeat those submissions, as I know my lords have it. But the important takeaway, we would suggest, from Mr. Justice Lewison's approach and how it is applied here uh, is that it is, in essence, no more than the reflection of reality. It doesn't make the receiver's position any more onerous. They control the exercise of voting power on any view. But what it does do is take out the charge orders from the time when they lose entitlement. Um, but it has no effect on the charge orders position before the receivers were appointed. And as we've already submitted in a different context, if the, if the regulator had chosen a relevant time before September 2003, there would be no difficulties at all in association uh, in this case. The problem, of course, is that uh, on these dates, the legislation simply did not permit them. <coughs> But there's one further short point, I think, to make before addressing very briefly what used to be the respondent's notice. Um, in his submissions on Wednesday, Mr. Stallworthy, uh, in connection with the protection, which he said was given to potential targets under Section 439 of the Pensions Act, stated that the potential target could limit, uh, and even it appears avoid, the future period of its exposure by severing its connection with an employer. And one of the examples he gave as to how that could be done was by winding up an intermediate holding company. And we're already slightly surprising to hear the regulator suggest that that's an appropriate course of conduct. And one suspects that if done in circumstances, 
um, to try to avoid a potential liability in a scheme and difficulty. It might even trigger regulatory action within the two-year look-back period, to which, of course, the potential target would be exposed anyway. But there are two further uh, significant points that come out of that. The first is that Mr. Stallworthy, in exchanges with my Lord Lord Justice Panel, seemed to explain that what he had in mind was a member's voluntary liquidation. But the problem with that, of course, is that it requires a 75% vote. And as is apparent from Section 43510B that we've just been looking at, control is deemed to be found in one third of the shares. So it is not a course which is open to the 33% shareholder. And the second, and potentially more important, the example given by Mr. Stallworthy appears to accept that once a liquidator is appointed, the connection and association going through the immediate company, the intermediate company to the employers, ceases. Now we agree with that. And the reason why it ceases is because the liquidator has, for all practical purposes, replaced the directors and shareholders. Was he saying it was the liquidation that made the difference or the dissolution that made the difference? Well, no, we understood him to be saying the liquidation. If he's saying the dissolution, then, of course, it's a separate point, and the point I'm about to make doesn't apply. But insofar as it is the former, that of liquidation, uh, it is a position that is analogous, directly analogous for all relevant purposes to that of receivership. The liquidator is treated as the agent um, of the company. And, and what could the um, uh, shareholder simply renounce his voting rights? Is that possible? If that's all that's causing him to be connected. Well, my lord, he could certainly um, do something equivalent in the sense of selling them, giving them away, uh, and ceasing getting himself off the register. But it would need, depending on, I think, on the articles, it would normally need a transfer. Yes. Okay. So the transfer email might have something to say about that. Well, it well, uh, might yes. not be easy to do. They, well, um, well they, 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 I mean, they might render themselves liable to an FSD. Yes. Yes, indeed. But, my Lord, insofar as we understood Mr. Stallworthy to be suggesting that it's that point of the liquidator, which we think is what he was saying, uh, it does actually accord again to standing back with the common sense view as to how this sense would actually apply. But, my Lord, could I turn very quickly to um, <coughs> the respondent's notice? Um, it is slightly unclear to us as to whether there are any legs left in any part of it um, at all. Mr. Stallworthy finished his submissions yesterday by effectively accepting, as we understand it, that his interest in the valuation point was for possible deployment at some later stage. But it seemed to be left by him asking um, my lords that if you were to remit the question of reasonableness to the tribunal, then the remittal should include permission for the additional questions he raised in respect to value to be addressed. And Lord, if there were any possibility of your lordships doing that, we would wish to address it um, and to address it briefly. And I don't know if I need to um, address it now, but if there is the possibility of my lords doing it, I would do so now. No, I don't think we want to hear you about it now. I mean, if... Um If we reach the stage, having considered our judgments, that the matter has got to go back to the tribunal for whatever reason, I think, I mean, we would obviously indicate that in our draft judgments, and then I think that would be the time for you to provide written submissions as to, as to the as to what should go back. I mean, in other words, whether whether the uh, 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 remittal back to the tribunal should should allow them to, if you like, reopen the valuation question. I mean, I don't I don't think we're going to be assisted by hearing um, argument on that point at the moment. Well, I'm very grateful, my lord. Uh, no, that we would impose very strong. Well, we understand that. I don't think 
I don't think we want to hear, hear you on the tube line. Or in that case, unless there are any other matters, I'll grab two. Uh, those are uh, possible. Yes, thank you. It was one, the additional case um, which had been addressed. And the application. And two, the application. Yes, yes, we understand. You're right. Yes, we'll certainly. Uh, uh, the Lord's uh, just, just to just, just to start. The Lord Justice Patton uh, asked my friend, Mr. Stallworthy, about the circumstances of the Lord's credit scheme. Uh, and uh, Mr. Stallworthy, this was done on page 83 of the transcript yesterday, and that's page 14. Uh, and Mr. Stallworthy replied that it's currently in a PPF assessment uh, over period and awaiting the results of this case. Now, I'm not sure that that is exactly what the Lord Lord Justice Patton is getting at in asking the question. What I understood the question to be getting at, and in any event, I think it's right that you should appreciate, is that the 23rd of December 2003D, that's the deed referred to in paragraph 408 of the judgment, uh, did three things as of the 31st of December 2003 uh, in response to the receivership of all participating employers. Uh, the first thing it did, as stated in paragraph 408, is that it ceased accrual so that no further service of employees with Fox Clever qualified for pension or benefits. Pension benefits. Uh, the second thing, I think this is what Lord Justice Patton is asking about, is that it fixed final pensionable salary, it stopped final pensionable salary uh, in the Box Clever Defined Benefit Scheme as of the 31st of December 2003. So it ceased accrual as of the 31st of December 2003, it, it fixed final pensionable salary as of the 31st of December 2003, with the result that no further salary increases in the Box, in box Clever affected the liabilities of the Box Clever Defined Benefit Scheme. Uh, and then uh, the, the victim previous things that would have been revaluation of the benefits of the firm thereafter. And the third thing it did, and I just mentioned this to you in order in case you were, you were scratching your heads over this and uh, which was after what I said in the judgment. The third thing it did was to confer power to wind up the box clever defined benefit scheme on the trustee. And and you'll have seen that paragraph four hundred and ten of the judgment. Uh, there's a reference to the fact that the trustee kept under a review after the 31st of December 2003. The question of whether the scheme should be wound up. And you, you may have been slightly confused by that because of paragraph 370, subparagraph 5 of the judgment, it was said that the power to wind up the scheme was in box clever technology, and seemingly that was a power which was incapable of being exercised because box clever technology had never made any contributions. Well, the answer is it was originally. But as of the 31st December 2003, it was in the trustee. Just, just so that not to cause any confusion, which certainly I, 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 I was confused by that. Uh, if you were Sorry, yeah. did you, did you say 370 where they refer to the yes, technology? 370, it's 370 sub paragraph 5. Yes. So that superseded as of the 31st December 2003. Square, so by, the, by the terms of the deed. By the terms of the 23rd of December 2003. Now, the Lord Lord Justice Newey made the point uh, that when the Box Clever Defined Benefit Scheme was established, and subsequently, employer and employee contributions would have been set with a due to provision of benefits under it. Um, and although there was, there was some crossing of purpose between the Lord and the learned friend on this, and the learned friend at that point in his submission was trying to get to focus on the 7th of March 2001 during the inter interim participation period uh, rather than on the 1st of October 2001 when the scheme actually started. Ultimately, it was accepted, it was established between you when the crossing of purpose was, was unraveled that, that, of course, the learned friend agreed uh, that, 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 that obviously uh, the contributions would have been set with a view to providing the benefits. But what, what else would they have been set with? And, and, and obviously, we, we, we wasn't going to disagree with that. Um, and 
the same. There's nothing unusual about that. What you were putting to him and nothing unusual and nothing unusual about his acceptance. But it's to be borne in mind in relation to this, so that the commerciality of the arrangement is perfectly appreciated. But as appears from paragraph 59 of the judgment, uh, the Box Clever scheme had its own actuary, nurses, Zinsky actuary. It had its own specialist pension solicitors, sackers, uh, and its own administrative able. So clearly everything was going to be done by the book as regards funding. Uh, and at law, as I uh, explained in opening, was there anything unusual in the assumption that past service benefits under the Grimard pension scheme would be moving across to the box clever if I benefit scheme. That's what happens in practice. The past service benefits, if the member so elects, it was their choice, the past service benefits move across to the box clever pension scheme because you would expect the past service benefits to be provided under a recipient scheme provided by an employer for whom you are present working. In the events that happen, there was no transfer across the past service benefits. As we know, it was impossible to establish a transfer value in respect of them. And uh, as the tribunal said, no criticism of anyone in relation to that. That's paragraph 384. Actuarial experience had simply moved against the parties. It had become impossible to square the circle in relation to that. Uh, there's one small point uh, that I should pick up. Um, my learned friend, uh, suggested to you, uh, this is at a, a, a one point, and this is at uh, page 79, um, uh, sorry, the transcript yesterday, page 79, uh, line 22 through to page 80, line 1, uh, that um, from the outset, when the box cover defined benefit scheme was set up, that is from the first October 2001, there was a whip effect, as he referred to it. He said, from the first of October 2001, um, the, the box cover scheme assumed responsibility for the top-up liabilities. It assumed uh, a responsibility uh, in respect of past service benefits in the uh, Grenada pension scheme. So far as regards salary experience in box clever, outstrip revaluation. I, I'm not sure that he, he meant to say that because it's not the case. I think he perhaps it just sort of slipped at, at, at that point. There's an earlier passage on that day where he doesn't seem to be quite saying that. But to be absolutely clear, when the Box Club Defined Benefit Scheme was set up on the 1st of October 2001, there was no top-up arrangement. The, the Box Club Defined Benefit Scheme was set up on the 1st of October 2001 on the basis that Box Clever Service from the 1st of October 2001 and Box Clever financial, uh, Final Pension for Salary from the 1st of October was to be provided for. The top up came later on the 1st of May 2003. Uh, and as we know, and as we know, and that's paragraph 394, paragraph 389 tells you that that added £5 million pounds of liabilities to the scheme. Sorry, paragraph 389 tells you that that added £5 million pounds of liabilities to the scheme. In other words, it was costed by the actuary at the time. Feeds back into your point, I know. The actuary knew what they were doing. It was costed by the actuary at the time, uh, and no doubt uh, actuarial calculations were done to work out what effect that should have on contributions. So naturally, there's a lead time, as you can imagine, to change benefits, and then you look again at contributions, and over time, it's an iterative process. And you'll recall from the uh, decision that the tribunal held that it, that the effort of the uh, top up was a reasonable course to adopt. That's 546. And in particular, that it was considerably better for the box club as a fine benefit scheme than accepting a transfer value. That's paragraph 550. Now, with those points uh, in, in mind, I, I just want to now move on to the substance of some points that my learned friend uh, made to you. Now, one of the uh, one of my learned friend's consistent themes was to pick up on what the upper tribunal described as quotes the key issue of responsibility. We know the upper tribunal was, was fixed on the notion of responsibility. That was the bedrock, bedrock of the upper tribunal's whole approach. And it's the basis of its summary conclusion at 588. The key issue of responsibility. 
And in this connection, the learned friend took you back to paragraphs 433 and 579 to, to, to where this particular point was deployed, developed and deployed by, by the other tribunal. And I, I would ask very quickly that you, you, you look again at 433 and uh, 579, and that was my learned friend invited you to do. Have four three three. Just you, you, you read it undoubtedly more than once. But just picking up from the, from the middle of it, even if all the decisions made by the targets uh, were taken for good commercial reasons at the time and without the benefit of hindsight, were perfectly reasonable decisions to take. So even if all the decisions by the targets were perfectly reasonable decisions to take, in our view, the key question is whether the construction that, that left the joint venture, venture vulnerable to adverse conditions in the market. So that Ronaldo should bear some responsibility. And I'd ask you, you to please underline some responsibility for the risks. And when you come to 579, it's the same point. Four lines down in 579. Granada should bear some responsibility for the risk. And that's as far as it ever went in the, ana in the analysis before the point was actually deployed against the targets in the summary conclusion of 588. Now I want to make two points in relation to Leonard Friend's reliance on this. First, care needs to be taken with the responsibility gloss, because section 437 does not say responsibility. Now, obviously, I, I can see that you, know, you, can, you, can, you can summarize uh, as you, however you like what you think the legislation is getting at. But Section 43.7 does not say responsibility. But secondly, even on the upper tribunal's own terms, it is a very qualified finding. The targets bear some responsibility for the risks that, 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 that which eventuated. And when you're asking yourselves whether no reasonable tribunal could or should have reached the conclusion that it was reasonable to impose an FSD in this case, given that all the transactions, all the alleged benefits predated legislation, all practical control and involvement predated legislation, that there's been denial of the opportunity of clearance, and there's no, nothing remotely in the way of for a decision against the targets on reasonableness on the basis that they're found to have some responsibility for the risks that eventuated is pretty weak. And it's some responsibility. It's not an accident. They've said it twice, and it's not simply cut to paste. It's some responsibility. Because it's some responsibility only because it was ultimately the business that failed here. As with the benefit of hindsight, it was always going to do. The appetite for TV rental in the UK was the problem. And you see from, for example, paragraph 379 of the decision, that by September 2002, they had to close 720 of their 900 shops. And that's a reflection of the way that, that the business had deteriorated. And this is, remember, all against the backdrop of the findings of the tribunal that this Everyone could have expected the business was going to be a success. Truth is, rent, the rent, rental TV, the, the, the market moved against rental TV, and it went, it went against rental TV in a fundamental way. This business was going to fail regardless of the level of sole borrowers in this situation. But we know that it's, the idea of going renting TVs today is obviously a, a seemingly a, 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 a nonsense. And, and in, in, um, in paragraph 453, they also use the phrase high degree of responsibility. Is it some responsibility? Is it a high risk responsibility? I mean, what is it? 
and have both been with us count the number of times they say it. What, what exactly is this this spine <coughs> that we're having to wrestle with here? And in any event, whatever the degree of responsibility, it's perfectly clear that there were other things going on here over which nobody had any control. And the other thing over which people had no control, of course, was the, the deficit in the box over defined benefit scheme. No doubt reflecting actuarial investment financial experience. These are these are things which had happened in the in the events, and they're they're, they're, they're just a, a fact of life. But uh, I'll come back to the point, and there may be an no opening. But there's a real feeling here of uh, being, being very wise and critical after the event of a focus on the joint venture as the uh, and the terms upon which the joint venture was set up as the low hanging fruit, because that's where all the attack is in this case, and a kind of basically ignoring the circumstances of the establishment of the defined benefit scheme. No real focus on the defined benefit scheme at all. Because at the end of the day, that scheme is actually something that was reasonably done. It's all joint venture, joint venture, joint venture. And the joint venture was, you know, it was cut and dry long before the defined benefit scheme was established. Now, Paul Panic said I was going to make the point in reply to uh, to, to uh, the learned friend on reasonable it's the point which is, if you like, the analogue, the equivalent, the point on paragraph two of the, uh, the first proposed further grounds of appeal. And it's, in fact, my Lord Lord Justice nailed this point from, from yesterday. It is unconvincing and circular for the upper tribunal to have held that one reasonableness under section 437 is, uh, is the protection against the legislation operating unfairly by reason of retrospectivity. Uh, and then to find the upper tribunal relying at, at, at the reasonableness stage on the prior finding that the legislation can be retrospective as a reason for when it actually comes to it, not giving that factor any real significant weight. This is apparent in the way in which it's kind of just back off in 5864. The upper tribunal, as I pointed out in the open, and my own friend not, did, not, did not respond to this, the upper tribunal having discounted along the way, and this is paragraph 492, second sentence, the upper tribunal having discounted along the way the unfairness arising from an FSD being imposed when all practical control and involvement of the targets was over before the legislation came into force. They discounted that on the way before they even undertook the balancing exercise. And similarly, that's what's implicit, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but no less plain, the upper tribunal was obviously discounting the unfairness arising from an FSD being imposed when all the transactions, in our case, preceded the legislation having been put in. Because the whole point, uh, as uh, no friend of panic has made, as I as I as I went opening, is that all of the transactions relied on in paragraph 586.1 and 2 are retrospective. And the question is, what is the justification on reasonable grounds for overcoming that? The answer might be fault. It might be an intention to preempt or subvert the legislation. It might be some other special justification. And I use that expression neutrally. I'm not a one b one in here. I'm just, it, it just happens to be a useful label. It might be some other special justification. But there's no adequate justification, special or otherwise, to justify the, we would say, extraordinary imposition of an FSD in this case. Now, benefit, of course. As you know, benefit, our submissions, in our submission, our submission on an area of law was in this straightforward. The, the upper tribunal clearly thought it was applying and then went on to apply a wide reading of benefit, paragraph 4430, when there was no justification for that. Now, the law of justice Pat pressed the friend to accept yesterday, but, and, and it, for some reason it proved rather difficult to get my friend to accept it, that the meaning of benefit within section 437 was a pure question of law, obviously it is. And, and it's, note, it's of note in this connection that when the Alpha Tribunal dealt with the issue of benefit, it did not consider that it was bringing into account as benefits 
items that did not fall within section 437B. It's clear from paragraph 495 and the heading and, uh, and explanation of 497 that the upper tribunal thought it was applying 437B. It didn't think it was applying some notion of benefit which existed penul penumbrally outside of section 437B, which required you to look at the value of benefits. And see, just as, as the tribunal thought it was plain, uh, thought it was applied in section 437A in relation to the, in respect of the relationship with the employers, that's 441 and 442. It didn't think it was applying some notion of relationship outside of the particular item of section 437. Now, as I made clear in opening, on an ordinary and natural meaning of the word benefit, it is apparent that the three benefits which the upper tribunal found could not sensibly be described as benefits within the contemplation of section 437. So bearing in mind that the upper tribunal had refused to find that the sum received was an overvalue, so no such benefit in that, those three benefits were the upfront cash payment to Granada of what was not found to be an overvalue of the use of its business, the possibility of upside, and the in insulation from downside. And our submission, just to be clear, by answer, in, in order to, put, in, in, to answer my friend in context, our submission was and is that none of those three so-called benefits fall within the ordinary natural and natural meaning of the word benefit. And that submission doesn't depend on the value of benefits. Plan. That submission is none of those three things falls within the ordinary natural meaning of the word benefit. But we were fortified in this conclusion by the fact that section 437b referred to the value of benefits. We said that's no accident because the FSG jurisdiction will wish to place a value quantum on financial support to be conferred. And we made the point that the, when it comes to a contribution notice by way of enforcement of an FSD, if unperformed, section 474c, the contribution notice provision, looks at the value of benefits for the same reason. So I submitted to you, to put it in context, <coughs> that, the, that when the legislation specifically enjoins you to look at the value of benefits, it would be very strange indeed if some wider concept of benefits that don't have to be valued was in play. Uh, and that if the alleged benefits are incapable of valuation, as is the case here, that was a clear pointer to the benefits not being benefits within 437 at all. Now, my learned friend had three points in relation to benefit, uh, and they're all, with respect, bad. <coughs> His first point um, was that, and to adopt from Lord, Lord Justice Mayer's criticism of another of his submissions, his first point was that he attempted to kick the value of the benefits point down the road, to kick the value of the benefits point down the road, saying that the value of benefits would only become material at the enforcement for non-compliance stage. That's uh, page 96, lines 3 to 6, yesterday. But as my Lord Lord Justice Patton pointed out, uh, immediately afterwards, the value of the benefits is required to be considered at the reasonableness stage, which is a precondition to the issue of an FSD at all. There is no scope for the regulator hiding this point off to quantum after the decision to impose an FSD has been made. It's just a bad point. The second point was that um, my friend said that it could not be contemplated that Section 437 would operate on the basis of the value of benefits because under the legislation as originally enacted, the regulator only had 12 months from the look-back date to get a determination from the determinations panel. And to have to value the benefits in the meantime would be unduly but onerous for the regulator. But that's simply an impossible submission. Section 437B could not be clearer. But in addition, it is to be borne in mind that the regulator has the luxury of choosing the look-back date under Section 439. It's from that date that the regulator has got a year, and thereby to ensure that it has its tackle in order by the time it gets to the determinations panel, i.e. get its tackle in order included. 
for the purposes of valuing the benefits as it is enjoined by Section 437B to do. And as the present case shows, notwithstanding the fact that the trustee was pressing the regulator from the 15th of July 2005 to issue an FSD, the look-back date was actually set for the 31st of December 2009. And my friend's third point uh, is that uh, he draws attention to the fact that there is no valuation methodology for the calculation of the value of benefits under 437B. And he contrasts section 44, 3 to 5, calculations for the purposes of the insufficient resource test, uh, as uh, elaborated in the FSD regulations. But the answer to this is simple and obvious. The benefits falling to be valued for the purposes of section 43.7 make diverse and to prescribe valuation methodologies for each of them is obviously unrealistic. The valuation methodologies will be as diverse as the benefits and just as a list of benefits is not being supplied, so a list of valuation methodologies is not being supplied. When you go to the insufficiently resourced uh, provisions, there isn't a mass of detail as suggested. The, section, the subsections of section 44 are short. They refer you to the FSD regulations, which are also short. And beyond telling you that you are to use open market values, they don't tell you much else. And they certainly don't do not prescribe valuation methodologies for the myriad assets that might be comprised within an entity, be it a potential target or an employer. And my final, very short point, my final very short point on benefit is that what my learned friend did accept uh, in uh, dialogue with you, indeed it was his submission and he was absolutely right, is that the issue of benefit has to be decided at the moment that the uh, FSD imposition is being assessed, be it by the determinations panel first instance or the other tribunal. Uh, that's the time to make the assessment, assessment. But that just demonstrates a further problem with the other tribunal's decision, since as I was we also been debating between us in this court, uh, the, upside, the upside point, the upside benefit, not only never materialised, but the, the date of the determination did not exist. And it's a clear error of law in identifying upside as a benefit at the date of determination. For that reason, a, a, a uh, in any event. But the, the, the point goes, go, go, goes further because the, when retrospectivity is built in, all of the alleged benefits were cut and dried before the 6th of April 2005. Unless I can assist you further, I apologise for speaking so quickly. I also apologise for my own time. No, thank you very much. Mr. Chamber. My Lords, two to two reply points. Um, first relates to the Manchester case, um, which you have in front of that um, bundle that you quoted before, tab 54. Yeah. Um, Volcanic accepted, as I understood his submissions, that the effect of the Manchester case is that this court cannot, um, even when hearing an appeal from a High Court judge, um, interfere with the judgment below simply because he disagrees with it or it would have reached a different view itself. He has to find a flaw to accept a fact. But he submitted that the Manchester case nevertheless applies a slightly less stringent test than uh, the Overy case and that the Manchester approach should be preferred here. Um, that is, we respectfully submit, wrong for this reason. Um, if you were to look at the, the, at the Manchester case, paragraph 64, which is the paragraph that my learned friend took to yes. the authorities bundle for TAP 15A.
the only limit on the jurisdiction of the appellate court was the requirement in what was then CPR Rule 52.113, it's now 52.21, I believe it's the same rule, that the decision must be wrong. And that's why um, in the middle of paragraph 64, you see the sentence beginning, the decision may be wrong, not because of some specific error of principle, etc., but because of an identifiable flaw in the reasoning. And then the following sentence, however, it is equally clear that the decision to be wrong under CPR 52.113 is not enough that the appellate court might have reached uh, or arrived at a different evaluation. Yeah. Uh, and then the recitation of the type of thing that would amount to a flaw. But as was pointed out in the Obrey case, which you also have in the same bundle of 49A, there is a difference between the approach under CPR Part 52 and the approach when the court is dealing with an appeal on a point of law. And this point is made very specifically at paragraph 17. You can see at 17, the court there records the submission on behalf of the appellants, which the intervener, the Human uh, Rights Commission, agreed. Sorry, I'm sorry. So we're going to the uh, to Obrey. Obrey. Yeah. Uh, sorry, which paragraph? 49A. Par uh, sorry, tab 49A. Yes, yes. And then paragraph 17. And in paragraph 17, you can see the submission being made that because the matter of proportionality didn't fall within the specialist competence of the upper tribunal, uh, the Court of Appeal should consider the appeal in accordance with the usual approach in CPR 52.11. That was the submission. And that submission, you can see from paragraph 18, was rejected. The submission that the court should consider the appeal in accordance with the usual approach in CPR 52.11 ignores the limitation expressly imposed by section 13.1. And then in the rest of that paragraph, which I've already taken from table 2.1, you can see the court there rejects the submission that the question whether the legislation is proportional one which falls outside of the competence uh, of the tribunal uh, and therefore requires, uh, uh, as the remainder of the judgment shows, there to be an error of law in the assessment of proportionality. So we, we say the o there's a very good reason why the Obrey case was not cited in the Manchester case, because it's dealing with a different appellate jurisdiction a point which the Court of Appeal themselves made expressly after hearing argument. And the Obrey case remains binding on this Court, in, in my respectful submission, for the approach which an appellate court ought to apply when hearing an appeal on a point of law under Section 13 of the Tribunal's Courts Enforcement Act 2007 in relation to the issue whether legislation is or is not proportionate uh, in terms of the European Convention on Human Rights. So that's all I wanted to say about the Manchester case. Um, the second uh, issue um, that I wanted to deal with is uh, the application to amend. Yeah. Um, now, uh, our main objection to the application to amend, quite apart from the fact that it wasn't presaged in the appellate notice, was and is that it involves criticising the tribunal's reasoning or failing to apply a legal text that no one was saying they should apply. Now Lord Panic accepted that that objection was a fair one in relation to paragraph one of his um, proposed amendment. But we say the objection has force not only in relation to paragraph one, but in relation to paragraph two as well. And one can see that by looking at the four matters, um, the particulars, if you like, under paragraph number two. The first of them makes clear that the point is still input as a criticism of the tribunal's reasoning in paragraphs five, eight, six, one, three. And the fourth is 
an express criticism of one formulation that the tribunal used uh, in paragraph uh, 5864, where they said that retrospectivity was a factor to which some weight should be given. Now, that is simply another way of saying that the language used by the tribunal shows that it didn't look for and didn't find a special justification within the meaning of A1, P1. Now, Lord Panic says I'm not prejudiced because I can answer the point, as I have sought to do, by pointing to the words in paragraph 588, where they specifically recognised the retrospective retrospectivity points were strong ones, but clearly outweighed by countervailing factors. And your Lordships have the submission I've already made that is in substance the same as finding that there was a special justification. But the problem is Lord Panic doesn't agree with that. He wants to be able to say that those words do not do the trick. That's does his submission. He, does he, is he necessarily saying that? I mean, as I understand it, what ground two more or less has become is a complaint that the tribunal could not reasonably reasonably conclude that there was special justification. Now, if that is the uh, supposed ground, then you don't have to worry too much about the precise wording of what the tribunal said. Well, uh, I, I accept that if we shear off the criticism in sub para 4, which is plainly and on its face a criticism of the wording used by the tribunal. Yes. So the, the point that my Lords makes there has some force, but the answer to it is that we are only considering this point if we have got to the stage where I have succeeded in showing that the legislation as a whole is proportionate and justified. And if I have got to a point where, I've, where the, the court is persuaded that the legislation as a whole is justified and proportionate, it is very difficult to see how there is any space for a separate argument, not based on any misdirection or alleged misdirection by the tribunal, that the application on the facts of this case um, was uh, one which fails to show the relevant special justification. So that's our answer if the point is put in that way, sheared of paragraph one and paragraph, subparagraph four, do, and paragraph. Two. I mean, do you need? You don't need to shear one exactly. I mean, I, I mean, you you don't accept the, the the point even in the limited form. No. But but if in substance the point is look. Everything was retrospective, no fault found. In all the circumstances, the tribunal could not find special justification. Now, if that's the way the point is put, then uh, I accept that I can't make a point based on prejudice. My point, if that's the way the point is put, is that there, there really is no space for that argument in the only circumstances in which the argument can arise or does arise, namely, those where the, tr the court is satisfied that the legislation itself, including its retrospective elements, is proportionate and justified, and if necessary, a special justification is shown for it. So, in other words, those, those, those are my answers to um, the amendment, unless I can assist further. And those are my yes, thank you. Well, we are obviously grateful to all of you for your submissions, those of you as well who have helped to prepare the um, submissions on both sides, and we'll take time to consider our judgment. Yeah. Well, before you um, uh, rise, you had <coughs> requested copies of the legislation as at. Oh, yes. Yes, that would be helpful. Three copies of the
goes in, uh, you suggest six. six. Authority is bundle one, tab, I think six A's. Yes. And this is the, um, this is the version in, oh yes, you put the date on as of the 21st of December. It's the two. date of the determination. Thank you. 